in preparing for TPP, negotiating PPP, and I'm sure that you get heartbroken by the news on TPP. So what is it now for Vietnam without TPP? Can you share your view? Well, I think for some of us who worked on this for a long time, it was hard to get out of bed for the next several days. Um, I think what is, um, you know, we, we've heard some discussions about TPP this morning, but I, I'd like to sort of highlight a couple parts of it that I think are what we're facing. Um, one is it's really the first um, goal for our two governments that we have failed to reach. Everything else, normalization, or you know, lifting the embargo, normalization, the bilateral trade agreement, WTO, TPP, at least the agreement, all of those battles were hard fought. Um, but, and they all took longer than we wish they would. They all um, t took more people. TPP is our first failure. And I think it's not clear yet what that failure will mean. Um, working on TPP meant that trade and investment had some parameters around it. So if there were difficulties on the ground, we would look to TPP to solve that problem. Or the, um, the regulatory regime or the goal would be solved through TPP or the tariff levels or the legal structure or what is uh, allowable or not allowable would all focus into the TPP. So it really gave those of us on the ground doing business a place to go. All of that has disappeared in terms of bilateral relationship. And I think that the shock of that <laughs> is still sort of rolling out. We, we, because we had the high-level visits last year of President Trump and, and Vietnam's Prime Minister to Washington, I think we kind of stayed on a state, but I think this year it's going to be very interesting to see what does the absence of TPP mean for U.S. companies. The, the, the uh, sort of follow-up to it, though, is that Vietnam and the other countries are going forward. There is TPP-11. It's not clear whether Canada is going to be able to stay in right away or come in a little bit later. But the momentum for TPP-11 is great. And certainly the American business community here is very supportive of that because, again, it will keep some of the regulatory issues, some of the standards, some of the criteria will live on in TPP-11. It'll be harder to figure out how U.S. companies share in that, but if you have a local Singapore office or a Vietnam office, you will then fit into TPP-11. So we're really shifting our look um, to the EU FTA and the standards that will come through the EU FTA, TPP-11, um, and whether some of the global standards, even if the U.S. is no longer part of TPP, whether those global standards that the U.S. used to support um, are built into to what's left of the, the trade agreements. Um, but I think it's, you know, TPP... Uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Paris, climate accord, um, it's really a new day. And what U.S. companies do here, what they're able to do here, certainly I think we feel at maybe the, the language at the top level hasn't changed, but the feeling lower down in the government in Vietnam has changed. And we see it regularly. We see that without a structure for us to work on together, it's very difficult to resolve issues. There's the TIFA now, which is the uh, Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, which is an avenue for the two governments to talk about trade issues. Um, but there's, it's, it's not binding. It doesn't reach a goal of a trade agreement. Um, it's not really a substance for TPP. What might be a substance, substitute for TPP would be an FTA, a free trade agreement. 
Um, and there's been a lot of talk about that in the American business community, um, with the two governments. The hard part about an FTA is we're no longer quite sure what is an FTA. When, when Vietnam was looking to join TPP, um, basically the uh, U.S.-Korea trade agreement was sort of the, you know, as Evan said, the glass floor, floor maybe. But you knew you, Vietnam, we in the business community could look at the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement and say, okay, TPP is going to be something either a little bit more than this, a little bit less than this, but this was sort of the framework agreement. We don't have a framework agreement right now for an FTA that this administration has identified. So NAFTA, not clear what happens to NAFTA. The uh, Korea free trade agreement is being renegotiated or some issues. So I think to know whether we in the business community or Vietnam should go down the road of an FTA, we need to know what is the model or what is the benchmark or, or what, what do those words mean now? And I think we're a little bit at sea uh, watching NAFTA, watching the FTA, uh, the Korea FTA, to really figure out what, what does this administration mean or not mean by a free trade agreement. Obviously, TPP, if, we, if a bilateral trade agreement was TPP with just two countries, I think we would all salute the flag and, and want to sign up for it. But uh, it's not clear yet what that framework is, and so we don't really have a model um, to shoot for. So in that midst of uncertainty, how the foreign investors look at Vietnam and we saw a huge flow of capital into Vietnam. And it seems that FII um, investors, they don't worry too much about the current situation of Vietnam and TPP. Is it correct, um, Mr. Scriven? Yeah, can you share some of uh, your views? Our analysis over, I think like Ginny says, it's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, initial shock to the system, our analysis was that of all of the TPP countries, Vietnam would be the biggest beneficiary in terms of contribution to economic growth. And uh, there were various studies that, uh, that suggested you know, GDP growth here might be one percentage point uh, higher every year over, say, 10 years. So that's out the window, and all of our marketing presentations and talking to, you know, we've had to rewrite them. Um, but it is, as you say, Twee, it, it, it appears to be the case that um, m much of the investing world has moved beyond, at least in the, in the financial investing sense, has moved beyond TPP. Is it because they have faith in the uh, reconstituted agreement? Um, is it because, you know, for Vietnam, the story is increasingly an Asian story anyway? Uh, wh whatever the reasons. Uh, and yes, as you say, the flows of, uh, of capital into Vietnam, if that's an indication of enthusiasm, have been very high. So um, for the, the financial markets, uh, for the last five years, foreign investors have been investing uh, you know, give or take two or three hundred million dollars a year. That's not very significant. Last year, 2017, that number reached a billion dollars. So that's a, a very big increase, despite all of the TPP noise. And actually, there's a there's there's, a, there's a, an additional item, which is the uh, sort of cross-border investment by companies into into Vietnamese companies, either private companies or or state enterprises, the, uh, the most high profile of which was, of course, $5 billion from Thailand into uh, Sabaco in December. So uh, you'd have to say that um, investors, if not from the US, but from most other parts of the world, uh, appear not to be that worried at the moment. Thank you. I remember the day that um, the TPP cancellation was announced, and um, actually, it 
second, the whole business community, and in particular, the private sectors who have hope and put a lot of um, faith. I think in the future of TPP, that I think the market is going to be, I think, more liberal and become bigger. But then I think that the, the Vietnamese business community seems to be pretty pragmatic and move on with life pretty quickly. So how did, how did you and your company do it? I think at the news that TPP is no longer on the table and may not be on, on the table for a while. So did you change any strategy or how do you basically adjust your um, business plan in the new world? Well, um, we have learned to be much more pragmatic now. We have learned to see other sides of the U.S. that we have not seen before. But life goes on, and business must continue as usual. Well, for my various factories that have been supplying to the U.S., whether they are in furniture, in food, in garment, in footwear, the business has grown, actually. We don't see any drop after TPP became without the U.S. And on top of that, not only me, but other friends of mine in the business community here uh, have moved into different areas to other countries instead of relying or concentrating on the U.S. So basically, while we are working a lot more within the region, within the ASEAN countries, and we are working a lot more with China right now. I think that that's what um, Dr. Medeiros um, mentioned in his speech about diversifying your partners right? and then try to find the balance in the unbalanced world or the other way around, try to find the unbalance in the balanced world. Um, but then I think I can imagine that the private sector is to be pragmatic and move on with life quickly. But it seems that our government, I think for now and then for once and for a change, also adopted the same approach. And I think the reality is that 2017 Vietnam, I think, did, um, I think, 6.8. We did 6.8 GDP growth, right? It was even um, existed of, um, I think, the so-called so the plan that the government had for that year. So you are the one who are very close to how our government think. And then what is your comment on the way how Vietnamese government adjust their plan and change their direction in the world that um, TPP is no longer available? To answer that question, let's actually let's go back to uh, not 2017, but 2016, right? When Vietnam finished negotiation, TPP, and also EU Vietnam FTA. So the strategy basically was at that time being finalized uh, for. Vietnam in the next five years, 2016, 2020, and it was still pretty much openness and integration, even more openness and deeper integration, right? With the expectation of TPP and EU Vietnam FTA. So it's not just the cancellation of TPP 12 and also, I mean, like basically uh, the the administration under President Trump that caused some rethinking uh, uh, within uh, the policy-making circle in Vietnam. The, the rethinking was that can Vietnam continue to grow fast, banking on openness and integration when the U.S. and even more broadly the advanced countries appear more and more anti-globalization, right? And, and it, it, it caused something like, it was a test in 2017 to see whether, can we still grow fast? And with the expectation of, of, 
of that. So what happened last year was actually exports recorded one of the fastest growth in, in many, many years, 21%, right? And, and actually the anti-globalization, the trade protectionists that the Vietnamese government kind of expected did not happen, did not happen. But they, you could see that actually if you look at the trade flows, right, total exports of Vietnam went up 21%, but exports to the US actually went up by only 8%, right? So it was like probably like <coughs> in, and Tin was reflecting on, like there was like conscious effort, not only from the government, but it's from Vietnamese companies, right? Yeah. To like anticipating the, the protectionism in the US, actually export didn't went up very, very rapidly in, in, the, uh, in the US. And, but then the, the thinking now is, okay, they expected some, a lot of pressure on trade protectionism from the US in 2017. It did not happen. And the thinking is that probably because uh, the US was more focused on tax reform than on trade. So the thinking is still, that is what we should expect uh, this year and next year, particularly 2018, maybe with tax reform done, there will be more protectionism. And so it's still like the thinking is we have to, to face it. But the strategy is because, but then looking at this, back to your point of 6.8% growth, where did it come from, right? So from the supply, the production, it came from FDI companies, right? From the demand side, it came from exports, right? So, so then it's, it's real, cons I mean, it's not like concern, but it, it requires that, okay, we survived 2017. What about 2018, right? So more protectionists, and, and I think the strategy now is, so Vietnam is very committed with openness, but it's more like we don't want to be seen as very aggressive, right? So we, we want to keep, we want to continue TPP, that's why the TPP 11 or the new name CPTPP is still on, uh, on the table. We want to ratify EU Vietnam FTA as soon as uh, possible. But in the past, we, we see Vietnam very visible in all of the trade negotiations. Right? Countries see Vietnam as very, very aggressive. So I think the strategy now is we still keep that strategy, but openly we will try not to be like the nil, where <laughs> for advanced country with protectionist sentiment to use the hammer, then not maybe less other larger countries be that, and we will push more quietly. I think that's that will be at least for now. I mean, you can see this year and next year. That's the the thinking in the government. 